This is the Catholic Wire. Uh, my brother was in a Catholic seminary, and my parents counseled him to get out of the seminary because things were changing very quickly. This priest gave a very liberal sermon, and right in the middle of the sermon, my father snapped his finger and said, we all got up, genuflected, and walked out. You know, I'm not going to tell you my opinion. I'm going to tell you what the Catholic Church has always taught. I'm going to also tell you what has changed in the Catholic Church in Vatican II. There was uh, somebody tried to stop us on the road. I just told the seminarian who had gotten ordained to the subdiacon, I said, turn your brights on and step on it as fast as you can. The bishop wanted to, me to give you this letter uh, to the superior, meaning myself. He said, uh, uh, I think that the time has come that your community is large enough that you should have your own bishop. I don't know uh, if this is God's will. As the, the reporter said to me, uh, he says, you know, I'm not Catholic. I don't understand between you and the archdiocese. And what's the difference? Could you explain it? I believe that the one true church of Christ is the Catholic church. I said, the archdiocese does not believe that anymore. I believe that the greatest work that we can do here on earth is to save souls. But what's been your greatest challenge as a bishop? In the last decades, many Catholics have experienced terrible moral persecution. Their faith, their traditions, were taken away from the churches. Many have lived for many years ignorant of the deprivation they suffered. Some are still going through that painful and at once beautiful process of rediscovering the Catholic faith. For the encouragement of those still in that journey, faithful Catholics have shared with us their challenges trials, and blessings. This is the story of their journey, Back to the Faith. I'm Kevin Davis, and this is The Catholic Wire. Thank you very much for, to Father Zepeda for, for letting me come on and to host this show, a show that I'm really excited about, and, and with Bishop Mark Pivarunas. Um, His Excellency was gracious enough to come on the show and to give us his, his valuable time to discuss his journey to the priesthood and to becoming a bishop and to running a, a school and, and a, a large congregation that now operates all around the world. So Your Excellency, um, I guess, where, where do we start? I guess the best place to start in, in asking your story is, where are you from? Where, where did you grow up? And, and I guess from there we'll go on and, and hear the rest of your story of how you ended up here. I would like to begin using the words of Archbishop Took when he wrote his autobiography uh, in French uh, back in the 1980s. I thought it was very appropriate that I could say the same words for myself. I will sing the praises and the mercies of God forever. And uh, I can't be grateful enough to have been born of a Catholic family. My mother was an immigrant from I Italy. Uh, she immigrated here from... Uh, I believe, uh, Solcedo, Italy, when she was four years old. Uh, Catholic, very much Catholic background. Uh, my father, uh, he was born in Chicago, but my grandparents, my father's parents, they were from Lithuania, very Catholic family. Uh, and it was a beautiful time to uh, grow up uh, in the Catholic faith. Uh, I went to a, a, a parish school that had about a thousand kids. Uh, from second grade to eighth grade. So I had Catholic education all my life. Um, as a family, we went to Mass every Sunday. During Lent, we go every day. Um, as a family, we practiced uh, going to confession weekly. It was a thing to go on Saturday. The whole family went for confession. Uh, when there was novenas or Stations of the Cross, we did those things as a family. Uh, prayed the family rosary, uh, wore the scapular, so I'm very blessed to have had some very good Catholic parents. Um, I was growing up in the 60s, and so those were turbulent times, of course, uh, especially right after Vatican Council II. So I remember 
the battles my father used to have with the priest with regard to the changes. Uh, my brother was in a Catholic seminary, and my parents, after I believe it was like three years in a seminary, my parents, you know, counseled them to get out of the seminary because the things were changing very quickly. Uh, just a interesting kind of a uh, uh, experience that I had uh, when I was in kindergarten uh, in first and second grade. Uh, we had nuns helping in first and I should say kindergarten first grade. I was in a public school because our Catholic school did not have a kindergarten or first grade, but we did go to CCD. Uh, and it's interesting because at that time there were sisters who were very, very conservative and there's, there, is, there were sisters who were very progressive as well. Uh, but we did get you know, the faith instilled in us. Uh, I never forget my second grade teacher, Sister Mary Grace. Um, I, I attribute a lot to her uh, teaching me for my first communion and confession. Uh, I remember she wrote on the board, hell. And she went into a whole class, a whole you know, religion class on what hell is going to be all about. And when I went home, I was resolved. Dear God, I don't want to go to hell. Uh, but she instilled that fear in us. Uh, third grade, I received my uh, first, I got confirmed in third grade. Uh, things were still very, very conservative back then. Fourth grade, things were great. And fifth grade, things began to change and ver change very quickly. Uh, the sisters, you know, uh, changed their habit, got a modified habit. Uh, I think I go back to fourth grade, uh, the priest, uh, at the time, came into our classroom to give a class instead of sister, and he drew, he, he drew a big mountain on the board, and he said, this mountain represents life in the top of the mountain's heaven. And uh, he said that we're going up to Catholic Road, but if you don't want to go up the Catholic Road, all religions basically go to this, follow the same path to heaven. Yeah, when, when did this venue, I should say, approximately? Uh, I'm trying to think here now. This must have been about uh, 67, 68. Wow. So uh, that was very upsetting to my father. Like, why are we spending all this money to send you to a Catholic school if they're telling you you don't have to be a Catholic? So very quickly, uh, you know, things were coming to a head at this parish. This parish was very, very progressive. And I'll never forget the day uh, this priest gave a very liberal sermon. And right in the middle of the sermon, my father snapped his finger and said, we all got up, genuflected, and walked out. And uh, I'll never forget that because the, the church was packed and we were up in the front. That was on, I believe, a Sunday. Uh, I remember the day very clearly about a day or two later. Uh, I'd been home from school and my father was working, doing something in the kitchen, putting up some wallpaper or something. Doorbell rang and he said, go see what it is. And there was the pastor. And I went and said, uh, Father Madden's at the door. And my father said, well, Tell him to apologize. I, I would come and get him, but I'm, I'm putting up this wallpaper. I can't, I, everything's wet right now. I got to put it up right now. So I asked Father, would you come in? My father's working in the kitchen. He can't come and greet you here. So my dad was very respectful. And Father Madden said, You know about Sunday? My dad said, I know about Sunday. Um, and so Father Madden said, Well, that can't, that can't go on again. My father said, Don't worry about it because we're going to go to another parish. We're done. So we went to another more conservative parish. So I'm thinking this is about 68, 69. Um, and then from around that time, uh, we knew something was wrong in the church. We knew there was, there was elements there that were, were no good. Um, we looked for what was the most conservative parish we could find. And then uh, we were able to hear a lecture by, at the time, Brother Dennis Shacoin. And he explained and put everything together that... Uh, the changes in the church and whatever, uh, they were obviously uh, done to destroy the church, destroy the faith. Uh, and this tied in with Our Lady's uh, Third Secret of Fatima. So we began attending a mass up in northern Chicago, uh, Father Leonard McNamara. He was an old priest, um, a very, very holy priest. And uh, he was allowed to have the Latin mass. He was basically retired, I believe he was in his late 80s, and he would have mass at the side altar of Our Lady. I'll never forget uh, his custom when he go out for mass was to uh, have a, 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 a flower to Our Lady. He'd go out and, you know, genuflect as best he could and put the flower on Our Lady's, you know, feet, Our Lady's feet at the statue and then begin the Latin mass. 
And uh, it's kind of interesting because we could basically tell who were the ones who really knew what was going on in the church and who were not. Because as, as Father Leonard McNamara was passing or distributing communion, a Novus Ordo priest and a modern priest would come out and go into the, over the table, you know, the, the modern tabernacle, and he'd go to distribute communion, and people would get up and walk away from him and go over to Father Leonard McNamara. So we know those people know that the Novus Ordo is not a good mass. And did you know, Your Excellency, as a boy then, how did you feel about it? Did you, did you understand what was happening, or was it more of an obedience to your, to your parents? No, I, I understood, because I could see the fruits of uh, what was going on. I remember my brother in the seminary, uh, his first two years, things were very, very conservative. And then there was a, a drastic change when he came back, uh, a, just a liberal, amongst the other seminarians, a liberal uh, mentality. Uh, and now they were trying to introduce guitar masses. And, and instead of mass up in the church, they'd, they'd go down to the cafeteria and set up a table and all this. It was very, uh, very, very liberal. And, and I know the battles my father used to have. My father would uh, sometimes talk to the priest about, why don't you preach about the rosary or about Our Lady or something of this nature? And, you know, unfortunately, things were going more along the lines of social issues and political issues as well. Uh, but it was, I could see the battle going on, and I can see my father would come home and explain what is wrong here, what's wrong there, and why this isn't right, what is that right? And, so it was a, a very much of a learning process. But I also have to say that uh, it took a lot of courage for my father to, to have us all walk out of the church right in the middle of mass and, uh, and then to confront the pastor of the, of the parish there. When we couldn't make it to Father Leonard McNamara up in the north side of Chicago, uh, we go to the Byzantine Catholic uh, rite. So that was not too far away. Uh, I remember, I think it was probably... Um, on a first Friday, we were going to make, you know, our first Fridays, and um, the priest came out of the confessional, and he looked around, and he pointed to me, and uh, I looked around like, he's only pointing to me, and he said, yes, you, come on back, and I, he said, I need a server. I said, Father, I, I wish I could, but I have no idea how to serve the Ukrainian Byzantine rite. I have no idea. He said, well, I'll help you. Just get a cassock on, and you put on this. It was almost like a tunic, uh, very, very ornate. It says, here's a booklet. So you have Ukrainian with the pronunciation and English on the other side. So it's just like what we have in the Latin, right? We have Latin on one side and English on the other. This was Ukrainian on one side, English on the other. And it had, you know, they could uh, spell it out, you know, with <coughs> phonetically spell out the words. So, you know, you could make it out and when to ring the bells. And uh, he said, I'll, I'll just, I'll whisper to you what we're going to do. Uh, so they had the conastasis and, uh, and everything was very, very solemn. I know we don't genuflect, so we would bow profoundly and we'd make the sign of the cross with three fingers going from right to left. But we were still Latin, right? Uh, but I have to say that my vocation really came, which this might sound odd, uh, but it came when I went to public school for the, like one year, a freshman year. Uh, There's probably about, I'm guessing, two or 3,000 kids in the school. And south side of Chicago, it was very, very rough. You had to learn how to fight. You always watching over your back to get not get beat up, not being the wrong part of the school at the wrong time. Uh, but it was extremely immoral. And that's what shocked me more than anything else. Uh, some of these students that used to be at the Catholic school I went to are now in public school, and they lived as if there was no heaven, no hell, uh, no commandments. And I was just, I was really shocked by that because going back to second grade with Sister Mary Grace, she talked about hell. And, you know, and I was always in the back of my mind, you don't want to go to hell. Because the way Sister Mary Grace explained it, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be nice and it's going to be for all eternity. So interestingly, after that year of public high school, um, I, I was resolved that I wanted to give my life to God. I wanted to secure my salvation. And I thought the best way I could do that is by becoming religious. So it was still another year before I joined a seminary. I joined a seminary when I was 15, uh, went to one year Catholic high school and then joined a seminary. This was in Idaho. Uh, interestingly, uh, we had a Father Clement Kubish. Providentially, he was from Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, when you hear his story, it was one of a battle as well. Uh, when the changes came with Vatican II and especially the Novus Ordo, Father Clement Kubish uh, didn't go along with the changes. And uh, 
the Archbishop, Archbishop Sheehan at the time, uh, told Father, you either go along with the changes or you have to get out. But if you go along with the changes, uh, then you're going to have a, it will give you a, a higher retirement, uh, more money for your retirement. And Father Clement Kubis told the Archbishop, he said, uh, hell is not just for a long time, it's forever. And he walked out. So Father Clement Kubish, uh, you know, had been taking care of some people here in Nebraska. Uh, he went to Idaho uh, to help out the big community there. Uh, and I can, those were just very, very happy days. But Father Clement Kubish, uh, as, a, as the priest that was our confessor and offered mass for us and gave sermons and he'd been priest for many, many years. So he had many wonderful experiences that he could relate to, but he had a battle as well. Um, so when I joined the seminary, it was not to become a bishop, not to become a priest, just simply to give my life to God, secure my salvation. And I wanted to put myself in a position where uh, I would be uh, most um, favorable for f pleasing God and, and serving him and saving my soul. And then it was by being a religious, I realized the good that could be done as a priest. I was told it was God's will that I began studies for the priesthood. So those were long days uh, of studies. And, and also uh, at the time uh, we were running uh, both a grade and high school. And uh, so very, very early on, I began teaching in the school, began with fifth and sixth grade, seventh and eighth grade, and finally into high school. Um, after Bishop George Musey ordained me in 1985, uh, after 11 years, I was 26 at the time, um, I was working at Mount St. Michael's. Uh, we were running the high school. Back then, uh, we had many, many uh, border students. Uh, we think we have border, a lot of border students now here in Omaha, but I remember in 1977, our, our first year at Mount St. Michael's, 77, 78, we had 100 borders boys. So I took care of 45 border high school, grade school, and uh, there was 55, I think, 55 high school boys. So about 100, 100 students. And then we had a lot of religious back then. We had like, I believe, between seminaries and religious brothers, I think we had like 65 or 70. So we had a fair good number of uh, Mount St. Michael's. But so in 1985, I was ordained. Uh, and one of the things that we did following the footsteps of Father Dennis Chacoin as a priest, uh, we began to give lectures around the United States. This is how CMRI grew so quickly uh, because of the lectures on Our Lady of Fatima, and also the changes in the church. Uh, they kind of go hand in hand, because Our Lady, uh, besides her message of you know, prayer, penance, amendment of life, uh, she talked about communism, Russia spreading her errors. She also talked about you know, so many souls going to hell and the need for prayer and sacrifice, praying the rosary. But she also gave that, that third secret that was to be revealed in 1960. And as we know, John XXIII basically squelched the secret uh, and it was not without a good reason because the changes in the church were very soon to come about. So we would give lectures around the country. And it's one thing that really made an impression on me for the need to stay put in one place is that uh, I gave a lecture up in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I believe at the time we must have had about 170 people to lecture. And that by this time, you know, for myself, this might sound archaic, but we had, uh, we had this, uh, I would just what well, kind of a project it's not a it's not a, a powerpoint they didn't have powerpoints back then it was like a, a you get a like a transparency sheet and put it on something and it would project it onto the wall so you use these sheets so when we're giving the lecture on our lady of fatima we always began with the rosary had a statue of our lady there and then i'd introduce myself who i was and uh start talking about the message of fatima and then from the message of fatima go right into the changes in the church and I always uh, like to use those transparencies. I still have them, even though it probably would be like, boy, that's ancient. But we had quotes from what the Catholic Church taught. And then we show what Vatican II was teaching. And we'd have photographs and pictures. And so I was telling the people, you know, I'm not going to tell you my opinion. I'm going to tell you what the Catholic Church has always taught. I'm going to also tell you what has changed in the Catholic Church in Vatican II. So when people had questions, I could say, well, okay, here's this, and here's this. Not my opinion. This is like Pope Pius XII, Pope Pius XI, St. Pius X, uh, and this is what Vatican II said, whatever. So people could see it right then and there. We had such a wonderful turnout. I, I, I have to laugh. Uh, 
So we had when we after gave about an hour lecture, you don't want to talk any longer than that because you wear people out. Um, we gave a little break, five, 10 minute break, and we had questions and answers. And a lot of times then the real questions come out, you know, about where do we go? What do we do? So one of the first questions was this man raises his hand and says, Father, I looked up your name in the Catholic directory, and your name's not in the Catholic directory, so I don't think you're a Catholic priest. And this other man stood up and said, we know everything he's saying is true. Who cares if his name is in some dumb book? <laughs> what he's saying is true, we, 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 we all think this way. And, and this man said, Father, we're ready to leave right now. We're gonna, we're gonna leave the modern church. Uh, where do we go from here? What are you going to offer us? And I said, well, uh, I'll be here till tomorrow. Then I got to fly out, but I'll be back in a month or two. And I can see the great disappointment. You know, you, you let everybody to know what's going on in the church and we didn't have anything to offer them because at that time we had very few priests. So it was, it was a disappointment for me. We had to list, we had a sign up sheet for people to write your name, address, phone number. So we could try to contact them in the future. But uh, I was thinking, we got to do something different. Now, other priests, Father Benedict Hughes was giving lectures, Father Dennis Shaquan was still giving lectures all around the country and even in other countries as well. Uh, so I gave a lecture in Omaha, Nebraska. It was at the, uh, I think it was the Hamilton Inn uh, near the West Roads. And uh, we had a very good turnout, very good response. And the same thing, what do we do? Where are we going to go from here? So I said, well, it was on a Saturday. I said, so tomorrow, Sunday, we're going to have mass. And we had Beth at that time, a small chapel. I said, gave the address. We're having mass at this time. And then I was thinking, this is nice, but we need to do something more than just this Sunday. I also, right during the, after we gave the lecture, between the lecture and the question and answer period, uh, one of the, the front desk called me and said, there was a call from somebody from an O'Neill, Nebraska, and he apologizes, he can't make it to the lecture. It's like three and a half hours away. He's a farmer, uh, he can't make it, but he wants to know if you would come and give a lecture up there. So I, I got the fan's phone number. I talked to him very briefly during that span. I said, uh, I'll be up there next Saturday. So I, I talked to our small group of parishioners. We had maybe about 35 people. And I said, uh, you know, I'm gonna have to come back next week. So. We'll plan on, I'll announce that there'll be mass next Sunday, but uh, next week I'm gonna come in on Friday, we'll go up to O'Neill, give a lecture up there as well. But I kept saying the people want something. They want something that uh, you, you, you can't just take something away from saying, okay, the Novus Ordo is, is a is a invalid mass, uh, Vatican II is issuing a new religion, and you can't go back there anymore. We gotta give them something, to, something in, in, in uh, in the absence of that. So that's how things really got going. I, I, for a year from 87 to 88, I flew every weekend uh, from Spokane to Omaha and then uh, do it a, a nice circuit here and then fly back on Sunday. Uh, it was in 1987 when we first started coming here that we started coming in July. Uh, come, I believe it was uh, September, the people were asking for a school and now we had to try to get a school registered and uh, through an interesting situation, we were able to get the school registered and we started our school, Mater Dei Academy. That wasn't known at that time but by that name, but 1987 is when we started the school. I believe we had nine students. Um, and I could also have to say this, that uh, at, after a year of coming back and forth, Father Dennis Shacoin, who is the superior, he said, you know, you can't be doing both trying to run up Mount St. Michael's and then do your thing in, in Omaha. So you're gonna have to make a decision. So 1988, I made a decision, yes, I'll just come full-time into Omaha. So by that time, we had several mass centers, plus I was covering Minnesota, Colorado, and also down in Kansas as well. Uh, and my, my, my thought was, if we can, you know, when opportunities come up to establish a mass center, establish it and do the best that you can and the rest is in God's hands, and then in the future, things will fall into place. Now, Father Dennis, in 1989, he resigned being Superior General, and I'm sure everyone knows that, uh, unfortunately, he came down with cancer and died. But uh, I was elected Superior General in 1989. So uh, what I first thing I did was I wanted to move the seminary in Spokane 
to Omaha. And the reason why I did that was because Mount St. Michael's is a beautiful building. Uh, the Jesuits built it in 1917. Uh, 60 years later, 1977, we bought it. It's a beautiful building, but it has an awful lot of upkeep. And when the seminarians are always available, unfortunately, their, their studies were suffering. So I thought, we need priests. We don't need maintenance men. So that was one of the first things we did. As I said, we're going to move the seminary from Spokane to Omaha, uh, and we're going to focus on we want priests. So Mater Dei Seminary began in 1989. Uh, it existed at Mount St. Michael's in, since the 70s. but uh, So we had a seminary there. And I also had uh, one of the priests, uh, Father Brendan Hughes, help, come and help me. So uh, he was able to assist with some of these mass centers. And we got the seminary going. Uh, school was going well and growing. Our mass centers were growing. Uh, and then we had a very uh, interesting situation. Um, now I'm not going to go into any of the, the particular details, but uh, the one, one of the heaviest crosses for me and my priesthood was a, a, a challenge that we encountered. And there was a mass center, a, a church, uh, and there was an unfortunate falling out between the, the lay people and the priest. Uh, there were issues with the priest. Uh, I thought there were serious issues with the priest. Uh, and this priest successfully was able to, uh, how would you say, I believe through misinformation, alienate the bishops of the United States from CMRI. So this was like 1990 to 91. Uh, and we, there was about 170 people at this church. All they wanted is the mass and the sacraments. They had issues with the priest. And it wasn't until the priest died that we realized that the priest had some very serious issues when he left the Novus Ordo. And there was actually lawsuits involved with his uh, leaving the diocese, et cetera. And the diocese didn't even know where there, he was at. I believe the diocese had to pay, um, you know, some reparations for the things that he had done in that parish. So I'm, I'm going to be very discreet about who and where and what. I'm not going to say. But we were basically without a bishop uh, for about, I don't know how many months. I, I, I asked, uh, you know, the bishops, you know, if they could please consider looking into the situation sending a priest to the parish, talk to the people. I believe they have legitimate concerns, and, you know, it was all declined. So there was a lot of pressure on me. We had, we had seminarians to be ordained and no one coming. We had about 90 students or children to be confirmed and nobody coming to give confirmation. So I was, a lot of, uh, I was under a lot of stress at that time. But we did have sisters, religious sisters in Mexico, working with Bishop Carmona, and uh, so... Uh, it was around this time that I invited Bishop Pomona to come and visit Mount St. Michael's. Uh, our, our intention was just to kind of go over what's going on in Mexico and how our sisters are working down there, etc. And we had a very nice visit. And his visit, cor cor you know, um, uh, corresponded to our, our, our monthly, or our, sorry, monthly, our yearly priest meeting. So uh, it was interesting, but when Bishop Pomona left, uh, to go back to Mexico, he left a, a, letter, a letter behind. So I never forget Father Ephraim Cordova saying, uh, the bishop wanted to, me to give you this letter. I said, well, it's in Spanish, read it to me. And he says, uh, to the superior, meaning myself, he said, uh, I think that the time has come that your community is large enough that you should have your own bishop. And I thought to myself, I don't know uh, if this is God's will. I'm going I'm to present it to the priest and see what they say. So, uh, like I say, Bishop Camona had left. We're having our priest meeting, and I just had Father Ephraim read translations from Spanish to English to the priest, uh, his petition that he'd like to consecrate one of our priests. So the, I told the priest, why don't you just pray about it and think about it? Uh, in the meantime, I was made aware that Bishop Camona was going to have ordinations in Hermosillo uh, for his, his Mexican seminarians. So I asked if we could... if, if he would be so kind as maybe ordain some of our priests to go down there. And, uh, and he, he said that would be fine. So I remember we actually, the seminarians and I flew to Phoenix. From Phoenix, we went to Nogales. Nogales, we went to Hermosillo. Uh, we had Bishop Carmona did the ordinations. In the evening, I had mass, and then Bishop Carmona had confirmations after that. And then we drove all the way back to 
to Phoenix the next uh, that very night. We we're traveling all night. Uh, I would never do that this day and age. It was pretty dangerous. Even even back then, I believe it was like 1991. There was uh, somebody tried to stop us on the road. I just told the seminarian who had gotten ordained to the subdiacon. I said, "Turn your brights on and step on it as fast as you can, and, and just show them we're not stopping. We're going to go right through. If you try to stop us, we're going right through." A little side note there. So interestingly, um, at that time, Bishop Cremona once again asked me, he said, this is in April, uh, so do, do you have a candidate? And I said, the priest is still praying about it. So I, I, when I got back to the United States, we contacted the priest and said, okay, normally we have our priest meetings in July and in January, but we're going to have a special meeting. We need to give Bishop Cremona an answer. And I said, at this point, it doesn't matter if, if, if you, as a group, as a group of priests, accept the proposal that one of us would be consecrated bishop, it's fine. And if you say no, that's fine too. But I said, if, if, if in the future you need ordinations, or you need confirmation, don't blame me or ask me to come up with some other solution because there is none. Uh, there isn't one. So long and short of it is, is that we had the meeting and, and, I, and I was under the circumstances, the priest realized we have no choice. We, we, we don't have any bishops. Uh, this priest had alienated them from us. Um, Bishop Cremona is offering to consecrate one of us. And uh, so whatever is God's will. So we had, we had a, basically a vote that first vote was going to be what we accepted proposal. And that was, I believe, unanimous. Then we had the, uh, the discussion of who should be chosen. So each priest would leave the room and then the priest would say anything they wanted for or against him. And, and I don't know what was said when I left the room. When I came back, one of the priests was saying, boy, if this, this is almost like the day of judgment, you know, <laughs> a little bit on the rough side here. So, so we had a vote and one of our priests, Father Dan Shaquin at this time was in New Zealand. He voted by phone. And so I got elected uh, to be consecrated. Uh, so then the consecration took place in, in September of 91. Uh, my motto uh, my, on my coat of arms is to lay down my life for the sheep. Uh, I believe that the greatest work that we can do here on earth is to save souls, to get souls to heaven, to save them from hell. Uh, Sister Mary Grace, once again, from the second grade, you know, don't want anybody to go to hell. You don't want to go there. But uh, more importantly, um, I want that to be the theme of my life, to try to spread the faith, to establish mass centers, to provide the mass and sacraments for people. Uh, it's like the people are, are sheep without a shepherd. And uh, the gift of faith is such a, a wonderful thing for all of us. I mean, we could have been born in another part of the world where we would not have been born in the Catholic faith. We could have been born in Africa or Asia. We could have been born a Muslim or who knows what. Uh, our chances of salvation would be a lot slimmer than it is for us being born in the Catholic faith. And not only that, but to have the true Catholic faith, the true faith in these times of apostasy. So uh, what we've been doing since 1991, uh, like I say, we moved to seminary from Spokane to Omaha. Uh, we want to establish the faith is, is whenever opportunities uh, present themselves, to try to do our very best to provide the Mass and Sacraments. So as an example, like in uh, Colorado, uh, we've been going to uh, Burlington, Colorado. It used to be Stratton. Uh, I believe it was since uh, 2002 or 2003. But we were invited to go there. Uh, and uh, we only had Mass for them every other Sunday. But then we were able to have Mass every Sunday. And we always had a group in Colorado Springs, but that group wanted us to come back and service them more regularly. Uh, same thing in Denver. And I, I, I just remember in the early days, uh, I would drive from Omaha to Denver on a Saturday, have a morning mass in Denver, afternoon mass in Colorado Springs, evening mass in Burlington, and then drive back to Omaha and start classes on Monday for Mater Day Academy. So I know that, you know, you can't maintain it all the time, but, but eventually, as we have more priests ordained, then we're able to put priests in these places. So now 
what, 2022, we have a, a resident priest in Burlington, a resident priest in Denver, resident priest in Colorado Springs. And uh, I believe that, um, you know, by the grace of God and the intercession of our Blessed Mother, uh, the faith is growing. And a lot of people, especially in this day and age, are realizing, especially with Francis I, he is so radically not Catholic that people are grasping there's something wrong within the church. I'd like to show you just a real brief uh, encounter I had. I was on the plane speaking to this, I would consider him a devout Catholic, uh, modern Catholic. And uh, so we were talking back and forth about different things. He was Knights of Columbus, uh, very involved with, with everything else in the church. And uh, so he was basically asking me, so what is your position? I, I hear you talk about the Latin mass, you don't go along with Vatican II. I said, well, I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, get right to the point. I don't think that this man's the Pope. And he, he was like stopped and stared. He said, you know, about 10 years ago, I think you're crazy. He said, I don't think you're crazy at all. Uh, and, and that is the interesting thing in this day and age, when you say, I don't recognize this man as the Pope, uh, there's no way that he could be the Pope. He's supposed to represent Christ. He's supposed to speak on behalf of Christ. Uh, you know, Christ promised to be with his church all days, even to the consummation of the world. How could this be that Christ would allow his church to err and fail in such a terrible way? And uh, it's, it's interesting how things are really spreading very, very quickly. Uh, so we have in the seminary... Um, 18 here, we have a, in Omaha now, we have the secular seminarians here in Omaha. We separated the secular seminarians from the religious seminarians, so the religious seminarians can have a, 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 a more religious atmosphere, you know, poverty, chastity, and obedience, the evangelical councils. Uh, so they're studying in Idaho, but under Father Benedict Hughes and Father Gregory Draymond uh, for the CMRI. We have in uh, western Colorado our novitiate, so the postulants and novices will go there to be under Father Bernard Welp, uh, getting their formation there. And then we have our seculars here. Uh, this coming um, May, God willing, we have six more priests uh, ordained. And uh, they're from different parts of the world. We have uh, one from Argentina, one from uh, Poland, one from Scotland. Uh, I was just talking to our priest in New Zealand he covers the Philippines, but also there is a group in South Korea that wants us to start um, uh, you know, servicing them with the Mass and Sacraments. There's also a place in Goa, uh, India, that wants us to come as well. Uh, we have a young man that wants to join a seminary from South Korea as well. So um, it, it's an interesting, very interesting times that uh, it reminds me that our Lord's promise, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. And I believe that's exactly what's happening. But by and large, I, I have no doubt that the faith is being kept alive. And, you know, there's pockets of Catholics here and there around the world, not great numbers, but pockets of them uh, that are persevering the faith. And it's especially through the intercession of our Blessed Mother. Um, I was just also going to say, too, uh, with regard to, um, you know, particulars, um, I know that there's a lot of demand for priests. Everyone wants a resident priest. And what we try to do is we'll try to send a priest on a regular basis as often as we can. We do the best that we can. That's God's will. And then as we have more priests ordained, then we're able to make them resident or allow them to be resident there. And from there, they can branch out many other different directions. I was just up in Canada with our priest up there, and things are very, very rapidly growing. His, his parish has like doubled, almost tripled in size because of COVID. And unfortunately, uh, the people of Canada, they had very severe restrictions with the COVID. Uh, though his oral churches were closed down, he kept his church open. And these people start coming to the church and the father was able to explain. And many of them remember this is the, the mass and the faith that I remember when I was a child. Uh, I was very, very amazed and impressed by how quickly things have grown in Canada. And so God can draw good from evil uh, that's the amazing thing. I also want to say, too, uh, I'd like to, to give credit where credit is due. 
uh, when we bless the church where Father Zapata is now in Denver, uh, at the blessing of the church, I said it would not be right for me to not remember those older priests who right in the 1960s made the decision to break with the Novus Ordo and have nothing to do with the modernism and the false ecumenism of Vatican II. So we, we enumerated a lot of those older priests. I mentioned just one, Father Clement Kubish, but there was a Father White, there was a Father Fenton. Uh, a lot of these priests, I had the privilege of meeting them as a young priest. And uh, they're the ones who really were the pioneers who kept the faith alive. And now we're just picking up where they left off. I, I, I have to smile. The same archbishop who expelled Father Clement Kubish from the diocese for not offering a Novus Ordo, go along with Vatican II, he was the same archbishop when we started building uh, Mary Immaculate Church here in 1988, we started building it. We had a front page article uh, in the Omaha World Herald. And uh, it was interesting because the, the reporter said to me, uh, he says, you know, I'm not Catholic. I don't understand between you and the archdiocese. And what's the difference? Could you explain it? And is it real as simply as possible? And I said, sure. I said, I'm a Roman Catholic. I don't go along with the changes of Vatican II. I believe that the one true church of Christ is the Catholic Church. I said, the Archdiocese does not believe that anymore. And he's writing it down. He's, I'm going to ask the Archbishop about that. <laughs> so now the problem with the Archbishop answering this question was this. If he says, no, we, we still believe the Catholic Church is one true church of Christ, then all his ecumenical endeavors go out the window with the Lutherans, the Methodists, and Anglicans, and everybody. It just goes right out the window because, hey, you know, they're all the separated brethren. We need, and it falls to communism. We need to work together, and we're all part of the church. But if he says, no, we don't believe that anymore, then I'm basically right. So it's interesting. I was eager to see how the archbishop answered that question. And his, his, he, he, he completely diverted it. He said, I do not wish to get into a theology in the newspaper. And I'm like, it was just a yes or no answer. Either you have changed, you, do, or you haven't changed. Yes or no, and he, he didn't give that answer. So uh, that's pretty much a, a summary of what, what, what's been going on. Uh, we were, uh, uh, like I say, uh, consecrated in 1991. Uh, right after I was consecrated, Bishop Pomona passed away. Uh, unfortunate car accident. So we inherited all of his mass centers and taking care of his priests down in Mexico. And that was, a, to me, a wonderful experience. But by 1993, I was so overwhelmed with trying to cover everything in the United States, covering in Mexico. Uh, that's when I proposed to Father Daniel Dolan at the time, if, if he would consider being consecrated to bishop to help me out in Mexico. Uh, I, I have to smile. Because in the United States, if you have maybe 40 or 50 confirmations, people think, oh, that's a pretty good sized group. The biggest group I had in Mexico was 450. That was on one occasion. And uh, the priests, we had to have it outside the church because it couldn't fit everybody. And the priest had this big microphone system, and he was praying every prayer, led to rosary, stations of the cross. He keeps praying to keep the people from talking, you know, keep the people praying. Uh, and I don't know, I must have been on number 300. He starts the litany of the saints, and the priest who was assisting me would say, Como se llama? What's your name? They say the name in Spanish, and I'd translate it in, in, into Latin, and the signal saying, Signo Crucis, etc. So I put my hand on that man's head, and, and he says, Como se llama? He tells me the name, and the priest starts the, the litany of the saints, and he says, Kyrie eleison. I said, Christe eleison. I mean, <laughs> By, by 300, you know, you're almost an automatic pilot. So by 450, uh, I was pretty well spent. I'm, I'm sure thinking back, it must have been over two hours. Then the photographs come. And, you know, if you know anything about the wonderful Mexican people, they love photographs. And there's always another one and another one and another one. We didn't, we didn't get this one. I get, get another family member in. And uh, I just remember the hours of all those uh, photographs. But the beautiful thing about Mexico uh, is how wonderfully the faith is being preserved there. In the cities, the big cities, it's very modern. It's just like the United States. Then you go into some of the rural areas, and it's very, very primitive. Uh, I remember going up to a, 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 this, these, this mountain city of Torero, 
and uh, it took us two hours to get up there. I remember the first time occasion I went up there, uh, it was very, very difficult. And on the second time I went to Truro, I had Father Dolan at the time, I was introducing him to Mexico because he was going to be a consecrated bishop and help me out. And uh, amazing, the, the, some of these places, the people didn't even speak Spanish. They spoke uh, an Indian dialect. Uh, and they were, it was, but the faith is still being practiced. It was just a wonderful thing. I was in the eastern part of uh, Mexico. Uh, we're in this very, very poor, humble village. And uh, the people were just, they, they gave me the best that they can. So there's a, a very small cot with a white sheet on it, no pillow. Uh, there's no running water, so I had a bucket of water. That's how you washed. And I was there for a day, and by the time I was done with the water, I was going to wash my hair, and I took the last butt of the water, and I poured the rainwater over my head. And I looked at the bucket, I says, Dear God, how I wish I had some more rainwater. You know, <laughs> it, was, it was poor but humble, and these people were, they're doing the best that they can to provide for you. So the consecrated Bishop uh, Dolan to help out in Mexico, 1993. By 1999, uh, the priests of Mexico, I got to know them very, very well. They, they were the Trento priests, the group that Bishop Camona had started. Uh, so I had mentioned to the priest, I want them to have a meeting and discuss who would be a possible candidate to be consecrated as bishop. And that... Uh, fell upon uh, Father Martin Davila. And uh, Father Davila was the one that accompanied Bishop Pomona to Spokane when I got consecrated in 1991. So I knew him very well. Uh, so I asked Bishop uh, Dolan if he would accompany me. And down in Acapulco in 1999, we consecrated Bishop Davila. And then uh, this, this past year, uh, because of the situation with COVID and the restrictions of travel, Bishop Martin Davila was going to be down in, in, in uh, South America. And I said, I think it would be really providential if you could consecrate uh, Father Pio Espina. I've known him since he was a, in, he was a teenager uh, down in Molinari, Argentina. We've gone down there many times. He comes from a very good Catholic family. His brother's a priest. Uh, and by the grace of God, you know, Bishop Davila consecrated Bishop uh, uh, Pio Espina. And... Uh, so now there's two bishops working with us, and we're uh, very grateful for their help. Um, and uh, we're also looking uh, in, the, in the near future a consecrated bishop for, for Europe as well. Uh, with regard to Europe, um, I think of especially like England, um, Father Oswald Baker. He had been an old traditional priest who never compromised with the modern mass and the Novus Ordo. Uh, I used to send him holy oils. Uh, I had confirmations for his people there down in Downham Market. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Father Oswald Baker. And uh, when he died, uh, his, his people petitioned if we could send a priest, and Father Riesling uh, would be going there to, to cover for them for Mass. And then after that was Father uh, Father uh, Ioannis Heine, who I ordained here. Uh, so they both alternate, alternate going to, to England. And now we have a group in Scotland, uh, that uh, we have been having the they've been having the mass for them up there, and we have a uh, seminarian from Scotland. Uh, he'll be ordained to the priesthood in May, uh, so he'll be resident with Father uh, Heine in Germany. But when he goes to England and Scotland, he'll be having regular mass there, so he'll be able to spend more time. But I still want him to be working under a, a, another priest and staying in close proximity with another priest. And that's our, our pretty much our practice when a priest is ordained. We want them to be to get some type of uh, further training under an older priest, uh, and that's what we're doing, uh, you know, uh, on a regular basis now. So we have six priests to be ordained uh, this coming May. Uh, we have several congregations of religious sisters, the CMRI sisters. I believe there's 48 of them in Spokane, Washington. We started a group of sisters here in 1992-93. Uh, uh, the Sisters of the Mother of God, there's 37 sisters here. Uh, and then we have uh, Sisters of Divine Providence and also Carmelite Sisters in Mexico as well. So all together, the priest and religious working, I think we're about uh, 160, 170 priests and religious working all together. And uh, my, my, like I say, my goal is to try to 
provide the Mass and the sacraments for as many people as possible. And I'm very appreciative of the sacrifices our priests go through to, uh, to bring the Mass and the sacraments to uh, many, many of the faithful. I, when, we, uh, uh, when we think about it, um, I, I tell the priest, I know it's a sacrifice sometimes to offer a third Mass that a travel great distances, but when we have priests ordained, they as priests need to utilize the priesthood. They need to truly uh, realize the harvest is indeed great, but the laborers are few. They need the opportunity to, to, to work. Uh, that's why they're ordained to the priesthood. And on the other hand, when they're ordained to the priesthood, I, I simply can't support everyone out of Omaha. We don't generate that amount of money. So these places where they go help support the priest, most importantly, provide the mass and sacraments for these people but secondly, help to bring about support of the priest as well. Uh, the other thing, besides starting mass centers, we want to do our very best to start schools. Uh, and this coming year, we're going to be starting a school in Alabama, another school in, uh, in Arkansas, and then we're going to be sending sisters up to Canada uh, to help out with the school that's just, be getting, just getting off its feet. Uh, because really, if you stop and think of it, the children are the future of the church, and we need to instill in them the faith. The world has become so immoral and incorrupt, immoral and corrupt, that we need to instill the faith in these children so they don't lose their faith. They need to be instructed. They need the mass and sacraments. They need the graces. Uh, a lot of families are struggling to keep their children on this great path, especially at these times. So we're just doing our best to uh, provide mass and sacraments to save as many souls as possible. Uh, getting into another topic, I know you mentioned that I could get into other topics. Uh, one of the things that Bishop Carmona wanted me to do when I was consecrated, in fact, he, he composed an oath. And he wanted me to sign this oath before I got consecrated. And the oath was to work for unity. And Bishop Carmona was very explicit about there are different theories about the papacy. There's different theories about how we should approach the situation of the church. And Bishop Carmona said, you know, we have to look at the more important thing is that there's going to be strength and unity. And I think it's a very unfortunate thing that people will become divisive because of what I would consider opinions. Uh, a lot of different opinions out there about a lot of different topics. And we have to realize that that's nothing new. If you read moral theology, if you read canon law, there has been in the history of the church a lot of different opinions. Uh, one a good example of that is between the Franciscans and the Dominicans on the Immaculate Conception. It wasn't until it was defined by Pope Pius IX in uh, 1854 that it became a dogma. But prior to that, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, they clashed on that issue. Between St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure, there was a difference of opinion with regard to the essential words for the consecration. But in more recent times, as Canon uh, 1068, there was a radical difference of opinion between the Holy Office and the Sacred, uh, sacred Rhoda that de determined marriage cases. Canon 1068 is an impediment. And the whole thing was not a question of the canon, but how to apply a canon to a certain medical condition, whether this particular medical condition would be considered an impediment to marriage. And there was a radical difference between them. Uh, and it just goes to show that you have two different departments within the Vatican under Pope Pius XII, and they're, they're completely opposed to how to view this particular canon in this particular case. So the idea of you know, the different opinions, I think it's unfortunate because a lot of lay people, they don't know the fine issues of dogmatic or moral theology or canon law. They respect their priest, and when they see these clashes going on, especially in public, uh, some people get scandalized by that. I don't, I'm not opposed to debating or discussing. I'm open to that very much so. But on the other hand, I think it's important for us to realize that, especially for people coming right from the Novus Ordo and are newly into the traditional movement, coming to Latin Mass, then they find out about these divisions and these arguments and these, these disagreements, and, and sometimes it gets heated they get scandalized, and I think that's un, un, it's, it's uncalled for altogether. So I, as one example, uh, you know, the, the issue of the uh, material pope, 
Amasei Vicantis, uh, Bishop McKenna, explained to me his, the theory about the material pope. And I actually flew to Monroe, Connecticut, and I spent two days talking to Bishop uh, McKenna about this at great length. Uh, I didn't condemn him. I thought, you know, I, I don't agree with this opinion, but uh, you know, so he's entitled to his opinion. And, and then we're not going to say he's not Catholic or we shouldn't go to his mass or, or something like that. In fact, we do have a seminarian uh, from, from Argentina who does hold to the material pope theory in our seminary. And I go back to the oath that Bishop Cremona wanted me to take to work for unity. And you know, that there's gonna be difference, there's gonna be difference of opinion. We gotta look at the bigger picture and that's the salvation of souls. And uh, so there's a lot of different uh, aspects and ideas of where we can go, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I would have to just say this on, on my part, uh, a lot of the opinions that I have and hold today were formed uh, early on by a lot of those older priests who were very strong in resisting Vatican II and were very faithful to the Catholic faith. Um, I think of Father uh, Francis Fenton. He was a very staunch Sede Vicantist. Um, there was in, in, in Mexico, you know, Bishop Carmona, and then there was Bishop Musi, and I could, you know, name a, a number of priests who were very strong in the faith and and what they taught and what they what their opinions were has been a big, a big influence on me of how I even think today. But once again, I, I think that you know we have to be following principles. Uh, when when people ask my opinion, I oftentimes I say, well, it's right here in moral theology. Let's read this right out of moral theology, or let's look at this. This is from Pope Pius. The, the, the St. Pius X or Pius XI or Pius XII or Pius IX and the Syllabus of Error or Mortale Manimos or Missici Corpus Christi, you know, or here's what it says in Canon Law. I like to show people this is what the church teaches and that's what we should follow too. Uh, but on the other hand, if someone has a difference of opinion for me, uh, I think it's an actually a waste of time to try to argue these things that you know, it will only be when, if, if and when a true pope is restored, these things are going to be settled. But until then, you know, they're going to have their opinions, and I'm in my opinions, and, you know, we, we shouldn't allow this to tear each other down. That's just, it's, that's very counterproductive. So uh, I'm not sure if you had any questions in particular or not. I, I do, Your Excellency. Before I get to the, the tougher questions, I guess, that I've had, uh, my wife wanted me to ask one for you. Sure. She wanted to know, why you chose the name Tarsisius when you chose, when you became a religious? Well, it was because I was always, uh, to me, fascinated by the early Christian martyrs. And that was a, a great desire uh, that I had <clears throat> to study the martyrs, and especially the early Christian martyrs and the catacombs, etc. I was very blessed <clears throat> to go to the catacombs multiple times. In fact, <clears throat> uh, actually had mass down in 1987 down in the catacombs. Catacombs of St. Calixtus on the Via Appia, uh, south of Rome. Uh, and that's where uh, St. Tarsisius, uh, his remains are, uh, right outside the catacombs there. But I always had a fascination for the catacombs, the early Christian martyrs, and how they had to uh, function in secret, and uh, their, their great courage to die for the faith. So, Yeah, Excellency, just a couple more Personal questions. What's been your greatest challenge as a bishop, if there's one? Well, it's like this. Um, the greatest challenge for me is trying to keep up with everything. And it's like, most importantly, I offer Mass every day, make meditation, pray my divine office, pray my rosary. And I, I need to maintain my spiritual life because if I'm going to bear any fruit in my life, it's going to be God, the grace of God and Our Lady's intercession. So maintaining that, but operating on multiple fronts. Uh, not just I'm not just involved with the seculars, I'm involved with the religious, not just the United States, we're involved with other countries, uh, and we're, in, we're working in so many different areas. And uh, I'm a spiritual father to a lot of people. And uh, when people call me, it's not just another number or just a, you know, a statistic, they're real people there. I consider them, it's my privilege to be able to help them out. And I take everybody to heart. And sometimes it's very difficult to 
to stay on top of everything. So I'm, I do the best that I can uh, as I'm able and uh, try to get back with, to as many people as I can in a, in a timely order. Uh, uh, four years ago, this, this December 5th was four years ago, I had my heart attack uh, and I learned a couple of things. One of the things I needed to learn is I knew I needed to get sleep. Uh, that's number one. And number two, I knew I needed to slow down a little bit. But uh, by grace of God, I'm, I'm recovered almost 100%. So on Sundays, I have my two masses in Omaha and I drive to Topeka for a third mass. Three hours there, three hours back, six hours. Still teach uh, in the school. Uh, the high school students, and to me that's important because they're our future. I mean, I taught you, uh, I think taught theology, didn't I? Theology and philosophy. Philosophy, theology, philosophy, and then after we teach there, we drive out to the seminary uh, about 45 minutes away, cover our canon law, moral theology, and philosophy. Uh, Father, uh, Father uh, Borja and Father Sanquist cover the other classes. Uh, in Omaha is helping me with, uh, is, with the school as uh, Father Sauner, the CMD sisters. Uh, but just after I'm done with the classes, I get back from the seminary, uh, then it's the work that I have to do as a bishop. Phone calls, emails, text messages, uh, and not just locally, but also, you know, our other mass centers around the country. And I try to be available to the priest. You know, I am, I'm very understanding that some of our priests, it's not like it was in a seminary. After years of being in a seminary, now they're out there by themselves. And my goal is to try to have two priests in each place. So we've been doing that quite successfully, but we still have priests. They're not together in one parish, one location, but they're in close proximity. So they can obviously, you know, make their weekly confessions and see each other. But nevertheless, uh, the priests need that, that moral support. So when priests call, I try to make sure I drop everything, take the call and get back to them. Now, some of them listening to this might say, well, how come he doesn't call me back, you know? Uh, because I'm calling a lot of other people back. I'm doing the best that I can. But I think it's, uh, you know, important uh, to realize that priests are humans uh, and they have their temptations. The devil like nothing more than to try to bring a priest down. That's why we have our priest meetings. Uh, and that's why I give priests as much attention as I can. Uh, try to take interest in everywhere I go, each place I visit for confirmations. Try to be thoroughly unaware of what's happening there. And trying to, you know, to become all things to all men, uh, try to help everybody out as much as I can. So the, the your question was the biggest challenge, trying to keep up with everything. Uh, it's very, very difficult. And then there's times which you have to say, okay, it's time to go to bed. And uh, I've learned after that heart attack four years ago that, uh, you know, I won't be uh, used to anybody if I'm dead. So I have to try to, try to stay alive and, uh, you know, um, Try to also, when I can, get some exercise and uh, do what I can to uh, stay healthy, most importantly spiritually, but also physically and, and mentally as well. So, Well, in, in Your Excellency, what is then your the greatest blessing of your life so far? Well, I mean, there's many blessings, uh, but my Catholic faith is the greatest. And being a bishop and a, a priest, I, I'm, I'm grateful that my parents were at my ordination. I mean, if it weren't for my parents, I would not have been a priest. My parents were... Both of my parents were there for my consecration. I was able to bury my parents too. So my parents died a very devout Catholic death and I'm very appreciative. Uh, when my mother died, you know, some years later, my dad came to live with me. He was in Omaha for, I don't know, nine, 10 years. Uh, and we were able to see him, uh, you know, become a part of the, our parish, get to know the students, especially our, our border students, the boys and girls that go to school here from out of, out, out of, out of states and other countries as well, uh, become very familiar with the seminarians and see their ordinations, uh, very active in our, in our parish life and seminary and life and school life. Uh, those are blessings. I, I, you know, I have no regrets. Uh, joined the seminary when I was 15, uh, very grateful to God for that vocation. And I'm very grateful for the formation that I had because those were very, very strict days back in the, when I first became a religious you know, postulant novice. And uh, our superiors were military men, and they ran it very, very strictly. Uh, penance was given out very generously, and, and uh, uh, you learn mortification and sacrifice very quickly. But that provides a foundation so that in the future, when God allows crosses in your life, you go, oh, that's nothing. We had to deal with this and that in the past, you know. So God, God in his sense, 
uh, you know, unbeknownst to us was letting things fall into place. But I'm very grateful, most, most importantly, for my faith and for my vocation and for the opportunities, uh, I can say with my parents, but I have also, to wrap it up, uh, I've, I've met some extremely devout and saintly people over the years that I, I, I'm very grateful to God that I've known them. I mean, people that I would say were extremely devout Catholics, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind that they're in heaven right now. And it was my privilege to be able to serve them, to provide them with the mass and sacraments, uh, to assist them in, in their dying hours. Uh, those, those are graces that, that those, those are memories are memories I'll always treasure. So, yeah, I since the last one for the people watching this video or videos, what what's one thing you'd want them to know? What what do you want to to tell them if it's in terms of advice or? how to survive the crazy world we're in, I suppose. Well, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24, and in other places in Scripture, we got to remind ourselves the important thing is perseverance. Uh, we have to persevere to the end. And there's no doubt in my mind that the situation of the church, the situation in the world is going to get progressively worse. Uh, we, we hear of a, the Great Reset and the internationalists wanting to you know, come up with a, a, a world economy uh, uh, where everyone's linked in together. And in fact, one of our churches, uh, we're, 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 we acquired a church in Alabama uh, and, and we're renovating it. We sent on a beautiful altar down there and hopefully next two months or so we'll be able to bless it. But there's a concern that the banking uh, that that church individually was doing was going to go electronic or digital, but a digital currency. And, you know, these are just stepping stones to a world system where everybody's linked in. Uh, and they, they, they're, they, what used to be considered a conspiracy is now being talked in the open, a great reset, a, a new world order. I mean, it's, it's being... And the amazing thing is that the Novus Ordo Church and the New World Order, they're working in step. They're working together. Uh, and as I think it was St. Teresa of Lazou said that she... She used to ponder the sufferings of the saints of the last ages, and she just would admire them. And I'm like, well, they're going to be very difficult times indeed. When our Lord said, think ye when I come again, I'm going to find faith on the earth. Uh, the times are going to be very, very trying. We know the general immorality surrounds us everywhere, but I also know that we're going to start being persecuted legislatively. So recently, uh, President Biden signed into law the Protection of Marriage Act, which is not protection of marriage as we, as Catholics, understand it. God made Adam and Eve, or male and female. Uh, the Protection of Marriage Act is going to supposedly protect uh, the gays and lesbians and transgenders and who knows what. But it's also going to penalize those who discriminate against them. And how do they define discrimination? Well, if, uh, if somebody comes to me and wants to get married and, and they're two gay men, I'm not going to marry them. Well, you, oh, I discriminated against them. You're going to lose your tax status. You're going to go to court. You discriminated against them. And we, we've already seen it with uh, individuals like the, 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 the baker. He used to bake cakes in Colorado, I believe it was. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, he said, I'm, I'm not discriminating. You can buy any cake. I'm not going to make a cake specially for you because I don't believe in that. And he got sued. Uh, so they, they, the, the, uh, the laws and the direction our country is going in is, is diabolical. It's destroying the family, the very basic unit of society. I mean, they're doing all that they can to destroy children, not just with abortion, but this, this whole transgender agenda when children are in their formative years to try to physically change them and destroy them. I mean, what do children know at this age? This is, this is, this is incredibly child abuse. Uh, but the times in which we live, uh, and, and it's not going to get any better. And I believe that for our faith, to profess our faith, to practice our faith, we're going to be persecuted. The important thing for us to be strong <laughs> now, we have to be strong now to be able to persevere to the end. So I think uh, we end with this, this concept. Uh, there's a beautiful book on a blessed mother. 
And it talks about how the Catholic Church parallels the life of Christ. And that it seems like, and this was written about 100 years ago, but it seems like the Church is now entering upon that phase of the life of Christ, the, the crucifixion. And it says that we should wonder less and pray more when someone falls away from the faith. It's a, it's a, a, it's a, a terrible thing to see someone lose their faith and go off the deep end or get involved with some who knows what and leave the Catholic Church or leave the Catholic faith. How, what blindness. It, it just shows the weakness of man. But in this book, it's talking about when our Lord was dying on the cross, his apostles and disciples abandoned him except for one. That was St. John. And why was St. John able to persevere when all the others abandoned Christ? It's because he was in the blood of the Virgin. And I believe the final battle is between Satan and the woman. And we will, if we stay close to Our Lady, we will persevere to the end. I know there's been a, a kind of a discussion about our Blessed Mother said at Fatima, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. Uh, I personally believe that it's not going to be what many people might think it's going to be. They're going to think that the world's going to convert and you're going to open up the newspaper and there's going to be the lives of the saints. You're going to turn on the radio and it's going to be Gregorian chant. Uh, no. Our Lord said, think ye when I come again, second coming, I'm going to find faith on the earth. Meaning the faith is going to be very, very uh, reduced. But Our Lady's heart will triumph because Satan did all that he could to destroy the church and to destroy souls, and he could never do it. And if, if in the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, the church is going to persevere, but it's going to be by the singular grace of our Blessed Mother, her intercession for us, that's going to help us persevere. So pray her rosary, wear her scapular, practice total consecration of the Blessed Virgin. Your faith has to be something that you just don't put in on Sunday. Once, you know, an hour, you have to live your faith. Your faith is something you do every day. The pray, sacrifice, receive the sacraments, uh, and uh, stay, stay stay close to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Yeah, Excellency, thank you so much for, for taking your time. And, and as we know, you're a very valuable time to, to do this interview. We appreciate it. We hope it was helpful for, for those watching. And maybe when I come back in four or five years from Germany, we can, we can do it again and, and, sure. and catch up. I appreciate it, and thank you, and God bless you. God bless you, too. Thank you for listening to The Catholic Wire. If you have found this show helpful, please say a prayer for all our collaborators. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels and share with your friends. For questions and comments, you may contact us at thecatholicwire.org.